2014, and you're moving into 2015, and you have not felt extraordinary. Some of you are married to people who remind you that you're not extraordinary. <laughs> you used to, before you lost your job. You used to, before whatever. You used to, before you, see, remember when you, when I, I couldn't, and back then, man, I couldn't be without you. Right now, I'm just like, are you back? <laughs> Already? So soon? <clears throat> so I'm saying, some of us are constantly reminded of that shadow, of that, of that experience that happened in childhood, just like Moses. And we're hunted constantly because of our mistakes. What happened, what, what somebody did to us. And I'm just telling you, if you are right now at the place where you don't feel that your life matters, this is exactly the place where God wants to show the extraordinary of His power in you and through you. And Moses is going to be encountered with three questions that I want to bring before you. So, Moses, he thought to himself, now that I see this whole thing and it's not consumed by the fire, I will go over and see this strange sight. And the question I'm going to ask, here's the question I'm going to ask. Why is it that the bush, why is it that this is not being consumed or burned up? So, so before you fill out your hand up, I want you to look at me for a second. This is what I call, and I want you to probably write yourself a note. This is what I call holy discontentment. Holy discontentment. Which implies, this is the opposite of whining. See, holy discontentment is when you see a situation and you challenge that with the purpose to grow in holiness. With the purpose to create a sense of wonder. So, so as, you, as you look at this, question number one that Moses brings into the picture is, why is this not being consumed? Why is it not being burned up? Our job, please look at me, our job, is not. We cannot produce the burning. We cannot produce the fire. We cannot control when God shows up. That's not in our control. You pray for your husband. You pray for your children. You continue to pray. But you cannot force for this to happen. Please listen. Moses has spent 40 years as a prince of Egypt. 40 years in the wilderness. And now finally God shows up. Have you ever felt like he's late? It's like, well, where are you God? Where you been, man? Been waiting for you. 80 years, he shows up, and the fire is there. The voice is there. It says, this is holy ground. Take off your sandals, because you're in holy ground. So please listen. You cannot manipulate when God shows up. You are only responsible. Please look at me. You're only responsible to create holy discontent. Because when your children look at the way you treat your wife, and the way you treat your parents, and you really treat each other, that's when you create that holy discontentment that you're like, oh my gosh, even after what my dad did to her, look at how she responds. Even though they went through fill in the blank, look at how they remain together. Uh, everybody follow me on this? Because see, the answer to that question of why is it that the bush is not burning up, the answer to the question is literally the birth. The reason why this is burning, uh, is not burning, the reason why this fire is not consuming, okay, is because the presence of God is there. From this conversation, a brand new nation is born. This man, as we're going to see next week, is going to turn back, turn around, go back to Egypt, deliver the people, and then journey into 40 years of wilderness. And eventually, the Savior will show up. So that's the first question. Second question, after conversing with Moses and God and trying to negotiate with God, Moses is kind of uh, given into the idea of going back to Egypt. See, I can just see Moses saying to God, hey man, you bring me an Egyptian, I'll take down the Egyptian. You bring me the Hebrews, I can take care of the Hebrews. You bring me shepherds that abuse ladies, I can do that. But you're asking me to go back and face Pharaoh? Have you forgotten who I am? See, this is why Moses said to the Lord, Who am I that I should go before Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And here's the beauty of the answer, because we don't have a whole lot of time to finish this conversation. But the answer to the question is, I get you, Moses. See, what makes you special, important, and extraordinary, as Stephen said in the book of Acts, it's not because of your family trait. It's not because of your accomplishments, because 
because you're the prince of Egypt. It's not because of your education. It's not because of your religious biases and, and your practices and your views. And, see, what's the answer, people? The reason why, and this is who you are, is because I am. So here's what I'm going to tell you this morning. If you are in this place and you don't know that God is with you, you're in trouble. You are in big trouble. Because the presence of God, what creates in us, is the sense of wonder. So the presence of God is what helps us to understand that this whole conversation is not about what you need to do for God. It's about what God does through you. It's not about how you understand who God is. Because see, some of us are so consumed by seeing the miraculous. That we're so driven by the next experience that we forsake the God who is the creator of those experiences. So Moses has to wrestle with this and understand that the presence of God is more than enough. So Moses, now that he dealt with his identity and understands that I am who I am, not because of what I have done or the things that I have not done yet, but it's because he is with me. Now Moses says to the Lord again, suppose I go to the Israelites. I take care of Pharaoh. Now talk about these knuckleheads. Go to the Israelites. And say, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, this Israelite asks me, what is his name? <laughs> Moses asked the question, why should I tell them? What do I tell them? So here's the question. It's not just who I am now, but now he asks the Lord, who are you? Who are you? Who do I tell them that you are? And the answer is in verse 14, because God replies and says, I am who, read with me please, I am who I am. Let's read it again. I am who I am. In other words, what God is trying to convey to this man, probably for the first time, is to understand that when you go on my behalf, when you go on my representation, when you go before kings, before leaders, before the common people, before the slaves, before the nations, you're not going on your name. You're not going on your behalf. You're not going because of who you are. You're going because of who I am. See, there is no coincidence. I really believe there is no coincidence. And if you haven't seen the movie, I'm going to spoil the movie for you. But wait until the end. Do not leave the theater prior to the end. The movie is long, but it's worth it. Because when the movie ends, as the movie ends, and they start giving you all these credits, the first thing that shows up on the screen is the name of the brother of the director. It says, in memory of, it gives the name. I couldn't help it. Got out of the movie theater and Google it. I said, what's up with this in memory of? Google it. See, the brother of the director was also a movie maker. And he committed suicide a couple of years ago. And even though the movie has some deviations from the pictures, just listen to this. Just be ready for this. The movie, the central theme, the central deal of the movie is literally that relationship between Moses and Ramses, between the two brothers, through the whole thing that eventually Moses comes back and says, let my people go. It's a whole thing about the movie. Now, I don't believe that's what the story is about in the Bible. I think the story is about the answer that God gave him when he asked, why is this bush not burn up? Because the answer to that question is because of the glory of God. See, the whole thing about this story and the remainder of all history is the glory of God. Christmas is about the glory of God. Life is about the glory of God. Your emotions about the glory of God. But again, the movie maker makes this whole thing about it. this movie of Exodus. It's about the, the relationship between them. And he portrays that relationship between, again, you know, Moses and Moses. And I couldn't help but remind myself. I said, see, this is, this, is where, this is where you and I can, we cannot move away from the basics of life. See, the Lord speaks to Moses in verse 15 and reminds him of the same principle. That this movie director <coughs> created this version of Exodus. The Lord, this is God speaking to Moses. You've got to convey this to the people. 
the Lord, the God, the God that you have failed has forgotten you for 400 years. Is the same God who spoke to Abraham. Is the same God who spoke to Isaac. Is the same God who spoke to Jacob. Is the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And here is where here is where the conversation takes a different spin for me. And again, just watching the movie because now he says, "This is my name. This is who I am." You may think that I have forgotten you. You may think that I'm panicking and I don't know what's going on in life. You may think that you are in control of life. You may think that somebody else has control over your life. And he says, this is my name. This is who I am. My name is, come on, what's the word? Forever. It's everlasting. See, you look at 400 years of a slavery. I look at time differently, says the Lord. You may be thinking right now, as Peter writes in, in, in his letters, 1st and 2nd Peter, as he writes to the church and says, because one year is like a thousand years. Remember the passage? 1st Peter 3, 8. And then he says, a thousand years is like one day. See, Peter is reminded, reminding the persecuted church that the pain that you're going through is always, it's always temporary. The suffering you're facing right now, your body changing and suffering and going through illness, is always temporary. And that's why it creates a sense of urgency, because if you and I know that we only have a window of opportunity, which is limited, limited, in the strength and the resources and time and, and relationships and everything, you have to understand that as a manager, you're responsible for this. So please listen to this. He says, this is my name, and my name is forever. This is the name that you shall, you, you, you all shall call me. Now, this is what I'm just reminded and blown away by the majesty and the mercy of God. Because we are having this conversation between Moses and a tree. Come on. <laughs> Moses in a tree. And, and through this conversation with the God of the Scriptures that he's having through this burning bush, he's talking about, and he's conveying to him that Moses, even though you are months and years away from you coming back to this very same mountain, and I'm going to give you a Decalogue, Ten Commandments, that you're going to use them to create and form the nations of the world. I want you to know this, Moses. I want you to remind yourself of this. You don't have to perform this Decalogue, this Ten Commandments for you to be my people. You don't have to. You are my people, not because of what you do. You are my people because of who you are. Because I chose you. Just the way I chose Abraham, being a pagan priest. Just the way Stephen says in, 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 in Acts that he was no ordinary child, even though he was born in a time of a massacre. Bible says, you will call me by this name. And here's the beauty of this story, guys. This name, this essence, this mercy, this holiness, this majesty, is to be conveyed from generation to generation. The United States of America is one generation away from missing the gospel. The United States of America we have biblical illiteracy. We have people who know about the God of the Bible through Hollywood. Pity us. We're in trouble. If what you know about the Bible is what social media tells you, I feel sorry for you, man. I, I literally feel if, if what you know about God is only what He shows the supernatural, and you get a miracle, and you're so. I'm all for miracles. Come on. You getting up this morning and being with us in here, driving, it's a miracle. Come on. Come on. You're taking your next breath. You're not supposed to take your next breath. Who told you that you deserve the next breath? It's a miracle. I, I want you to see the passion of this man because from this conversation, he's literally going to walk into the place where he did not want it to go back. And he's going to shave the, literally the fate, the, the, the result of thousands 
and millions of people because he believed that the name of God was enough. And he believed that this name was beyond his very own essence as a leader. So, so I'm, just, I'm just totally amazed to know that historically, Egyptians walked with Moses out of Egypt. That through the plague, for 18 months, plague after plague after plague after plague, Egyptians were convicted to the heart. They knew that there was something about the God of this people. My question is, do people know about our God? Do people really see difference when we walk into classrooms? into offices, into businesses? Is there something that creates this holy discontentment when we lay down in the same bed with that same lady for 20, 40, 50, 60 years? Or are you waiting for the next big thing to happen so you can really believe in God? Shame on us. Shame on us that we're waiting for something. This is the day that we have to understand that the covenant name of the Lord remains forever. And this name is created so we can relate to Him at a personal level. And even if you decide to reject this name, watch this. If you decide to reject this name, this name will be here from generation to generation. Generation 